That's amazing. All right. Well, happy Monday night. I'm so excited to be joined tonight by Dr. Julie Hamilton. And um, just a reminder, if you're seeing those live transcript words and you don't want those, you can just go to the carrot and hide the subtitle, but we want to have them there for anyone that wants or needs them. So good to have you here tonight. And I can't wait to hear your wonderful self intro because there are no words that I can possibly generate to describe you. Um, we've had some really like great deep conversations uh, that have guided me already through some fun periods. Um, so I was reading Project Relationship this weekend, which is one of Dr. Jolie's writings. I just wanted to read a little quote that really hopped out to me. My music is on? Oh my God, it's my music. I'm so sorry. Everybody. No, you're great. <laughs> you're great. I was like, wow, cool. Thank you though. Cause that's, that's like me to have my music on and not even hear it. Um, so running a business built from nothing isn't for everyone. It's not just that it takes a ton of energy to build, grow and run your business. Sure. It does take energy, but not just any old kind. Being an entrepreneur means you bring inspiration, initiative, dedicated, dedication, and decisiveness every day. You look at a big picture and manage details. To be a bit cliche, you contain multitudes and it shows. In fact, plenty of studies have shown that entrepreneurs score high on qualities like persistence, initiative, vision, and resilience. So we are so excited to be joined today. This is a great book. If any of you are looking for some inspiration, uh, super great book, Project Relationship, and delighted to be joined by, have you joining our class today, Dr. Julie Hamilton. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I So I am Dr. Julie Hamilton. That's the last time I'm saying doctor. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I am currently standing on the unceded territory of the Pecumtuck people. And it is an absolute pleasure to be here. So I, one, it was just awesome to see this room full of people who clearly care about human centered entrepreneurship. That just makes me like jazzed beyond belief. And maybe that word dates me all by itself, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to share my story. I have a weird winding path through entrepreneurship. Um, but what I do right now is I work as a coach for people who are entrepreneurs who are tired of their relationships sucking because aren't we all? Um, I help people bring their entrepreneurial skills to bear on their relationships because those skills like being risk tolerant and creative, innovative, and a relationship creator, those skills are exactly what we need in order to really, really, really make our relationships and our whole family life work better. So that's not what I've always done though. Um, my academic work is on jealousy. I study jealousy through the lens of depth psychology. So that's Jungian and archetypal psychology. Um, that's what my doctorate's in. And the container I study jealousy in is in the polyamorous community. So I tend to do my research with um, ethically non-monogamous people. And I have just put a study into the field to consider how jealousy is experienced differently by monogamous people. So that's some of what I do right now. And the other thing that I do is take care of these seven wild teenagers and try to have a life. Um, I, so my kids are now, I think it's worth saying that they are 13 to 21. So technically the oldest one is not a teenager anymore. She probably would like me to draw attention to that. The reason I bring up that I have so many kids is because sometimes when people think about entrepreneurship, they imagine themselves having to put 100% of themselves into that life. And they can't really imagine how it's going to fit to have a, a complicated other world. 
And I am proof positive that it is completely possible. I've run 12 businesses over the last, oh, 23, 24 years. Um, I am a starter. I like to start things. Sometimes I close them. Sometimes I leave them in the hands of better people. Sometimes I sell them. Just depends on what my mood is at the time. Um, I don't like to do the same thing over and over again. So I'm in it for whatever needs to happen right now. When I got into entrepreneurship, I thought it was going to be about, well, money, bottom line. I thought that I was doing it because I couldn't really imagine. I, I tried working corporate for a little while. That lasted all of like two years. I, I really just did not. It did not work for me. Um, so I went back to running businesses, which I had started my first one when I was a teenager. Well, honestly, I started my first one when I was eight. I don't usually count that one. Everybody sells stuff when they're like eight, nine years old, right? That's totally normal. Um, I started businesses because I wanted money and I was raised blue collar and there was no money in my family. So I started businesses and I sold things and I navigated the murky waters of figuring out how to negotiate for more pay from um quasi employers and under the table payers. And then I figured out how to sell things I was making because I was always making stuff. And then I got married really young, like really young. I was 17 when I got engaged and I was 20 when I got married. I don't recommend it. It's not, it's not in the plan. I don't think for most people, but when I had, um, when I got pregnant for the first time at 22, I knew I couldn't do the corporate life any longer because it wasn't going to give me anything resembling what I thought I wanted for family. So I just jumped off the edge of the cliff <laughs> and back into the entrepreneurial world. And since then, I've run a whole bunch of different kinds of businesses. The thing that I think is most different about how I've done it is I have been pretty unattached to the specific outcomes and whether I achieved these particular measures and metrics of like, do I have a seven figure business? Do I have a, do I have this many employees? Do I have the, I let that be and focused on whether I was creating the life that I wanted to have at any given moment. And I think it was actually my children that gifted me with that because I had this rambunctious group of children who I decided because I didn't know any better. I decided to homeschool them um, way before it was cool. I, I wanted to have flexibility. I wanted to be able to creatively engage with them. And so I didn't measure my businesses in the same way that everybody told me I was supposed to. And every time I picked up another entrepreneurial book or I took another class or a couple of times I'd I went back and took college classes, every time I did that, I ran up against the same problem over and over again. I ran up against do it this way. And here's the outcome. Here's what everybody wants. Everybody wants the seven figure business and everybody wants the four hour work week and everybody wants. And that <laughs> that's just never been me. I am not an, I guess I'm not an everybody, but I'm also guessing that you all aren't an everybody. I'm guessing that you have visions for your life that go far beyond what you can find in the first chapter of anybody's book, including mine. I made a life for myself that meant that I was able to do weird things like homeschool a whole bunch of children and um, move in and out of fields like designing wedding gowns and um, doing birth and childbirth support and lactation support. And then I decided to open and run a CrossFit for a while. And then... <laughs> And then I became a psychologist and I did that for a while. And having the capacity to change gears mattered so much more to me than any particular other metric. I never did figure out how to measure it and make it into some infographic that would make some investor happy or make even maybe my partners happy. But I did figure out how to make a life that actually satisfies me. And it allowed me the freedom to, you know, throw my life into the wood chipper when I was 33 and I decided I wasn't happy and I needed to get out of a marriage that I was in that wasn't working. Entrepreneurship was the thing that allowed me to claim my own space, even when I had no idea what I was doing. I regret nothing. 
<laughs> though I'm pretty sure I did some pretty regrettable things. <laughs> I don't regret any of it. When I first met Meg and she told me about the program, I was like, where has this been all my life? Just the idea of centering the human experience just lights me up. I think that that is, if that's not at the heart of what we're doing, I don't know why we're even bothering. So I'm so glad you all exist. I'm so glad you're all studying this. Um, I am an open book. I, <laughs> I could talk for as long as you wanted me to. I could talk forever and ever and ever, but there is no question too personal. You can't bother me. Um, and I have a podcast to prove it. I talk about just everything in, you know, and then some. Um, I'd be really honored if you all have questions or Meg, if you have some questions and would like to sort of guide a conversation that would be the most supportive to these lovely people. So Jolie, you talked about um, the different ebbs and flows and journeys and how being human centered has looked in your entrepreneurial path. Could you tell us a little bit more about some of the nuances of those and how those have fed your spirit, other spirits, and you know what the business model has been like for those and how that journey, um, I love that you know capacity to change gears and make a life that satisfies you. Um, claiming space even amidst uncertainty, we say traction at the edge of certainty. Yeah. Um, so super lot resonate with that. Yeah, if you would, Tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, I think that for me, trying to discover myself was really the purpose. It's been the purpose for every business I've run. Um, it's been my purpose in parenting. And maybe that sounds selfish to some people, but I actually view my parenting as a spiritual journey. I view running businesses as part of my process of individuation. You can tell I like Carl Jung, so I'll use that word a whole bunch. But um, I... I first started running businesses thinking that I had to do it a certain way. And when I, when I shifted from, there was an early business I was running where I was designing wedding gowns. I went to school for fashion design when I was a young teenager. Um, and I, I was doing that for a while and I loved it. I loved it because I could hands-on create a garment on a person. But at the time, it was, it was the late 90s, well, mid to late 90s, and there just wasn't really a way to make that profitable in a way that would support my burgeoning family, this family that I envisioned having very soon. Um, and so I had to figure out what to do about that. And it was sort of not pre-internet, but pre-internet the way we know it now. So I didn't have the, the, um, I didn't have the capacity to imagine as big as I might these days. But what I did have was the capacity to imagine what I needed in my life every day. And I knew I needed to be making something with my hands. So I shifted out of that role of, of like trying to craft one of a kind garments and try, trying to make money doing that because that just wasn't working. I shifted out of that and started teaching people how to sew which I had not seen in my life at all. And it sounds like a really small and simple business. And you know what? It was. And it was a big downshift in some ways because making bridal gowns gets you a lot of attention, right? You, you kind of, as the designer, are the attention for a while. Um, I loved being present for photographs and like, it's just a whole scene. It's a whole thing. But downshifting into teaching other people how to use their hands let me slow my life way down and I wasn't making any more money per se, but all of a sudden I had opened up to the idea that, oh, in fact, I'm a teacher. Oh, oh, that's a thing I do. And so I started carving out a new life for myself. That opened up a dozen new avenues. And from there, I began um, cr crafting and creating actually a whole bunch of different um ways in which teaching has been one of the threads of my life. I wound up teaching in like different age spaces, multi-mixed age spaces, teaching all different kinds of things, everything from um, sewing to philosophy and <laughs> woodworking, like all these, like just anything. Um, because what I found is that I could center the human experience then. So every single time I created a new business, if I moved away from that, that 
working with people and being connected to them. And I moved into that, what I think people call right now the CEO mindset, and I get it, it's important. I don't want to downplay it. But when I moved into that place where I was disconnected from my hands and from what I was doing and, and from my heart and how I was connecting to other individuals who I was helping, I just wasn't satisfied. And so for me, it's been a, this constant dance of, of forays into CEO mind and then allowing myself to return to what truly fuels me, what feeds me, what makes me feel like a human amongst other humans. So I just keep finding myself returning to one-to-one -to -one work, returning to small groups, returning to touching people's lives in some way. And that's taken a ton of different forms, but it's always about actually interacting with someone else's life for me. So that's a little bit. Did that answer your question? God, I can really talk for a long time. <laughs> I think that's amazing. Would you also share a little bit, because it's often a common thread among our students, about what it was like owning a CrossFit gym? And what that <laughs> to you? Yeah, that was an adventure. I, I, um, <laughs> so I opened my first CrossFit with my first husband, and within, um, within five months, I had divorced him. So, and a theme that I know from having worked out in a lot of CrossFit gyms is there is a lot of um, non-ethical, non-monogamy going on in those spaces. And my experience was that it was so juiced up. It was so exciting because there was so much focus on community when I was involved in it. This was in, this would be like 2009 to 2014, 15-ish, somewhere around there. There was so much focus on community. I loved it. And I loved the idea behind this um, owning something that wasn't exactly a franchise. So I had tons of intellectual freedom. I had tons of freedom to run my business however I wanted. However, the downside was that I didn't have a lot of structure. I, I didn't have any guidance as to what to do. And I hated Greg Glassman, just like with affection unspeakable, like just did not get along with him. Um, so for me, running a CrossFit was all about connecting to people. And if I could go back and do it all over again, I would have niched way the hell down. I would have stayed in a much smaller space and I would have helped just the people I wanted to help and said to heck with trying to be a CrossFit that's for everyone. And instead I would have made a really curated community that was really, really yummy and delicious for the people who wanted to work with me. And that's been a theme actually throughout my whole life. I, I used to think that community needed to be about actually including everyone. And I've now shifted gears to feel like, no, actually let myself be a beacon and let the people who resonate with me come, come and be in my space. And I will absolutely create a safe haven for anybody who wants to be in that space, but I don't actually have to be for everyone. I don't have to do that. I can be safe for everyone without being for everyone, if that makes sense. And that's where, when I parted ways with CrossFit, and allowed myself to just be whoever I wanted to be instead of trying to fit into that, that label, I found that I, I niched down in every part of my life and got more specific. So let's talk about that segmentation and how you discern yummy and delicious and fit within your life <laughs> and within the customers that you serve. Okay, this is where it becomes really, really helpful that I am. So I am an ASEC certified sex educator. Um, I happen to sit on the board for ASEC. That is the national organizing body that certifies sex educators, therapists, and counselors. Training, doing advanced training in, in sexuality means I've had to get really clear about what desire feels like in my body. And so that's why I use words like yummy and, and delicious. Because for me, defining what makes a satisfying business is about actually getting clear about what my body signals are telling me and trusting them. I'm an analytic type. So this was a hard one lesson. Like I am an ENTJ on the Myers-Briggs. I'm like, not what you would expect to have be a touchy feely person. Um, and yet I am a touchy feely person. I had to learn to trust my body the hard way 
by not trusting it over and over again and getting into a marriage that didn't fit, creating businesses that didn't fit, and yeah, building a whole world around me that didn't fit. Around 2010 um, was when, so in 2009, I threw my whole life into the wood chipper, divorce, um, lost everything, lost two businesses. Um, it was just, I managed to keep my kids and my house. And that was it. And that was really hard to do. But that was also the turning point between a, a life before where I fought my way through every single problem into a life afterwards. And this took a good six years to get there, six years of a lot of emotional and spiritual work to get to a spot where I can trust that my body will tell me what's right for me and that I can be caring and careful with other people and so and so create you know safe spaces and healthy spaces for people without selling myself out without saying that means I have to do whatever serves everybody else first and martyr myself which is why I mean it's kind of why project relationship the book like starts off the way it does it's all too easy to want to be the kind of person who serves everyone and then leaves themselves off the list and so when I when I started learning about how to teach sexuality, how to teach issue like really intense issues around, um, yeah, desire and what it means to be in touch with ourselves, I, I had to get in touch with my own body. Learning how to do that left me able to make much, actually much faster decisions than my analyzing brain, which I did not think was possible. And it left me in a place to be more creative with how I built things. Because if you're going to build a sexuality related business, you better be creative. And every sexuality professional is in some way an entrepreneur. So if that's your jam, I've got you there too. That's awesome. Um, folks, feel free to hop in as things are jumping out to you. Christina, if you don't mind, I might call you out because I loved your early prompt in there. Um, you have a couple in there. So Christina, can I pass it to you for curiosity? Sure, sure. I'm loving this talk so much. Um, I really like like your authenticity, like it really resonates with me and it feels good to hear someone like speak truthfully and like state that they're an open book. I mean, that just like creates a safe space in itself. So I appreciate you speaking like that. So well, it was really nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know who Lovey Jones is. She's like a, she's a TED Talk speaker. But anyways, I was watching her this morning and she mentioned how like, um, she mentioned how she was talking about silence and how silence does no good for anybody, any group. Um, but she also touched on boundaries. And I like how you said, well, she, Lovey Jones, she mentioned that if you're for everybody, you must not be speaking up enough about your boundaries. So that really resonated with what you just said and like your niche and like being a beacon for those that resonate with you. So yeah, that's, that's what I thought. Okay. That's a fascinating point. I don't know Lovey, but I'm already in love. This is fabulous. Um, <laughs> so I, what I'm hearing is what is, what is it about being silent that lets us feel like we are being open? like that we're creating, you know, more connection. A lot of people do hold themselves in. And I think I got lucky because I was born, um, I was born pretty bold and brash. And then I was trained that way. My family trained me to be even more bold and brash. Um, so I didn't have to leap over major hurdles to get there, to be transparent. But um, being able to set boundaries is key to being able to be this transparent. I am super transparent. I talk about my open relationships. I talk about making very unconventional choices. And I talk about how I've hurt people in the past. And I do it because that's how I think I can communicate to people that in fact, they can, they can challenge themselves in my space and they can challenge me and I will respond but I did take a lot of boundary work. And when I say boundary work, let's get clear. There's boundary work gets a lot of, gets a lot of playtime right now. It gets a lot of airtime, but it still, it has to start 
with being clear about what you, what is a full yes and what is a full no for yourself. Like we talk about boundaries and often we go right to where is my boundary? Well, if you haven't identified what feels good in your own body, if you haven't identified what feels good in your life, and if you don't know what you're aiming at, it is really hard to set an appropriate boundary. Yeah. And sorry, in this video, she mentioned how she can set boundaries because she knows exactly she's very clear on who she is. So someone asked in the like, how are you, how are you vulnerable? And she's like, because I am clear on who I am. And right. so there's nothing really stopping her from showing up. But yeah. kind of what you were talking about. Yeah, totally. And I have found that it's easy right now in this era of the personal brand. It is so easy to create a curated personal, it's a persona. Okay. So, so here from that really literal, like persona as mask, it's very easy to create a well curated persona and be vulnerable from that persona. And now I'm not going to tell any of you not to do that. For some people that feels like solid boundary setting. They want to create a persona that rests sort of outside of their personal boundary. And they want that to hold the space of their person in the public world. I decided to go a different way with that. I decided to be myself in public and it's scary. I gave my, my TEDx talk and I just outed myself to the world as non-monogamous and where I live. And at the time I was doing that, it didn't feel terribly safe. And it, it didn't occur to me not to do it because it's still the true thing about me and right. my life. And right. I really believe that if I try to create a persona, then I have to remember who to be in public. And I just don't feel like that works, especially at this time when I want to create real connection and I can't create real connection and not be flawed. I, I am flawed. I've made lots of mistakes. Right. That's, that's where I feel like it's, it's about being vulnerable is about being, yeah, knowing who you are and being willing to risk risk showing people where you haven't been your, your highest self, your best self. It's a little scary, but it's also where the juice is. Thank you. Awesome. Tori, next question to you. Um, hello, this is awesome. Thank you so much for taking time to come and chat with us. You kind of already answered it. I was just, my question was just, how do you allow yourself to be so vulnerable with your clients? And I was wondering, could you say that thing that you just said? Because <laughs> I want to write it down. It was, I can't pretend to be somebody that I'm not because then I have to remember who oh, yes. that person is. Like that was, that's really impactful. Could you speak more into that? That was really cool. Yeah. So I actually, I, I think that's a Mark Twain quote. Um, that, that's not the exact quote, but it's, a, I'm paraphrasing Mark Twain. And it, it's in a song my children learned when they were very little, when they were like little, little kids in a chorus. It's, um, it's about always tell the truth because if you do, it's easier to remember than a lie. Like that's his only reason. Like just tell the truth because it's easier to remember than a lie. I think that when we're creating personas, we're not thinking about those as lies. And there's, there's some truth to that. You can show one face of yourself, right? If you imagine yourself as a multifaceted gem, right? It's okay to not want to show the whole gem to everyone. That can be part of your boundary setting. But for me, when I try to show only one or maybe two faces of that gem, I find that I can't show up fully for my clients and I can't, I can't help them to believe that they will be okay in this world that bangs you up because I am my best proof. What I do right now is help people create really, really spectacularly amazing relationships. And the only way to do that is by showing up fully in your relationship. So not everybody has to show up fully on Instagram. I think it's okay to curate your Instagram, but you're going to need to show up fully somewhere. Even if that somewhere is just for you and your partner or partners, even if that somewhere is just for you, that's it. Even if you are the only person. So I think it's as much about not telling yourself a curated truth. If you can be vulnerable with yourself, be honest about where you've been, what you've done, how you've harmed others, what's happened, how you've made restitution for that. Almost any future is possible from there. That's, that's where I want to live. 
So. Thank you so much. That was awesome. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. <laughs> hey, Lonnie, you had a great question in here too. Do you want me to read it or would you like to share? Uh, yeah, I can kind of read it off because I'm I'm always bad at typing to see if I actually get my thoughts out. That's just not the way I communicate. So um, you've spoke a little bit about like you knew what your life goals were. And it sounds like a lot of those came around the idea of family and how you wanted to build that up and that style of relationship. And I just want to know, like, how did you combine that with your entrepreneurial lifestyle and like match those two very different goals in a lot of ways of like financially supporting your family or the time commitments and then keeping those t similar time commitments to or however like just managing those multi-different lifestyles and combining it into one successful or happy one you just hit on it you hit on it it's about defining what success looked like so i spent plenty of my 20s broke as heck because I was willing to make choices that left me in entrepreneurial control of my life, like juggling all those balls and managing only to drop the ones that bounce and also raising a family. Um, it was not easy, but the choices weren't, for me, the choices weren't, am I going to run this business or am I not? It was, how big am I gonna let it get? how like i am a big believer in the right sized business i ran plenty of businesses that i intentionally kept small because that was the right size for the time i was in there were plenty of times when i thought oh i really wish i had designed this to create more more financial benefit but just as i would start down that road I would have some situation come up. My mother was chronically ill my whole life. She um, passed away when I was 35 and I took care of her for a lot of her life. And I took care of my brother when he um, got sick a few years later. So I've spent a lot of time caretaking. So every time I would be thinking about like, how can I leverage my business acumen for more money? Another family situation would come up. I'm not sure that I chose it so much as it chose me, but I was there. I walked every member of my family of origin to their end. I was there. I birthed my babies at home and I was there to homeschool them. And I did these things because they mattered to me. And I could think of that as having cost me um, or having had to balance something. But instead, I actually felt like it was just the freedom. Thank God I had the freedom to when my brother was diagnosed with cancer at 35 to just, just turn to him and be there for him. I, I'm so grateful that I could. Um, so really for me, the heart of my entrepreneurial activity has been about being able to be flexible and, and change and move things rather than get to this specific spot. Honestly, getting to this specific spot, if I, if I want to you know, hit a particular metric, that's never been hard. Like every time I've ever set a metric, I've hit it. That's that's just a matter of laying out a plan and then executing it, getting the right people on board. That's pretty doable. But being ready to say goodbye to somebody that you're not ready to say goodbye to or being prepared to make a hard decision about, you know, who's going to do the caretaking and or navigating painful divorces, like that stuff, that's hard. So I just honestly leaned into the fact that if I was, if I was facing, if I was facing outward with my full truth, if I was really showing up in business and at home fully, then whatever decision I had to make that day was going to be the right one. The only wrong decision was going to come if I, if I tried to prioritize what other people thought was important. This is why I don't focus on the word balance because I don't really care. I, I actually, ironically, I'm standing on a balance board as we speak, but I don't really care about balance. I care about agility. That matters more to me. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks for asking. So there's a vibe in a lot of your work around verbs, action, <laughs> uh, consent, and this like thread of joy. And I wondered if you might um, 
speak a little bit about how those things weave together in a tapestry for you and impact your journey as an entrepreneur. And I guess also it'd be helpful to have a little bit of context around as you're building this very unique new business or have built this unique new business and are thinking about your journey and that, how you define those words with your customer and what their experience is in finding their way to you. Yeah. Right now, um, choosing those words. And I'm so glad you said joy because that is actually a central concept. I want people to feel like my joy is uh, my enthusiasm for their life helps buoy them through the rough times because if they come into my office, they're probably having a relationship problem or not feeling awesome about how their life is going. Right. So I, I leverage my own natural enthusiasm to help other people find theirs. So that one's easy for me. I, I've always been that kind of person. Um, I also have though, I, a commitment to helping people define for themselves what their life should look like. And so as I've been designing this particular business, so I, I got my doctorate later in life. So I, I've, just graduated in um, in February of 2020. I defended my dissertation and flew home into the pandemic. And then I started this particular iteration of my business life. So I've been one year, it's been fantastic. It's been awesome. And the reason it's been so successful is because I haven't made a single decision that wasn't based on what I would have fun doing. I just kept saying, will this be fun? I mean, that's why I said yes to talking with your class, Meg. I was like, will that be fun for me? If it will do it. It doesn't mean that there haven't been hard things too, but I've chosen to focus the vast majority of my energy on things that would be entertaining, engaging, and fun. And that's how I, I'm working my languaging. I've actually been wrestling with this. I have my doctorate is in Jungian psychology. A lot of Jungians tend towards a much more like introverted and quiet lifestyle. And that's not me. There's nothing quiet about me. Um, I stuck out like a sore thumb at Pacifica. <laughs> I just really did. Um, and that was okay. A little uncomfortable, but okay. Um, I was also the only person constantly talking about sex. So, you know, whatever. Um, I, <laughs> I found that if I was consistently talking from a place of joy and enthusiasm, even in these quiet and introverted spaces, other people found new parts of themselves. So I haven't really worried too much about whether my messaging is right, but instead I've trusted that if I really speak right from my gut, right from my center, that the right people will find me. And it has it has been proven out over and over and over again. This is the best. This is the fastest I've been able to grow a business in the worst circumstances. So, and this has been the most I've trusted myself up until now. I think there has always been this part of me that has been nervous and has held back. And I have so many examples of that, of almost letting myself out of the cage. This time I came out roaring and I was like, nope, I'm just, it's going to be me. That's what they're getting. And so people are either all in or all out, which also means they commit, they pay their invoices faster <laughs> and they decide whether they want to work with me faster. So I don't wind up with clients like stringing me along because that is not, I am not a fan of that. Um, stringing me along from that decision-making point. And instead they're, they're with me because they can tell whether I'm the right person for them and I'm not the right fit for everybody. That's cool. That's why I have a deep referral bench. Just start building that right now. Whatever you do, start building your referral bench. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Christina had a question here, uh, seconded by Michaela. I'm very interested and curious about Jolie's academic work on jealousy. Okay. Well, I could talk about that all day long. Um, I can. I can also send Meg some. Um, a whole bunch of links to, I have talked about this on podcast after podcast um, because I love it. Um, my academic work on jealousy is centered on the idea that there, that jealousy is an archetypal um, experience, which means we cannot cure it, crush it, or kill it. All we can do is decide whether to dance with it or repress it. And if we repress it, it's a little bit like holding a beach ball underwater. It's going to pop up 
and it's going to be not where you want it to. So um, I study jealousy from a very proactive perspective, and I problem solve with people what to do with jealousy when it shows up, because I don't think that it is the entirely negative experience that we've been led to believe. I do think that there are all kinds of problems. Jealousy is still the only emotion that we, we defend violence uh, because, of, because of an emotion. Like That does not make any sense to me. But um, I study jealousy from the perspective that if we, if we think of jealousy as an indicator that we care about someone deeply, then we have the opportunity then to take actions that reinforce our love and rehumanize the person we've decided is going to interrupt our love bond, rehumanize them instead of dehumanize them. That's the long and short of my jealousy work. Awesome. Oh gosh. Somebody just asked what led me to study jealousy. Should I say? <laughs> Um, I tattooed the, the, the root, um, zealous on my back accidentally. Um, so it's literally been following me around. Um, I, I leapt out of an unhappy marriage into an extraordinarily unhappy polyamorous triad and learned the hard way that if you forbid the word jealousy in relationships, it will clobber you. I got really curious about that. I spent a lot of time wondering why I'd done that to myself and uh, decided to study my way out of it. So I did. <laughs> Gavin has a great question here. Your comments on agility were incredibly interesting. What are some internal, maybe even, bleh, maybe even personal attributes that allow you to be agile in the mindset of action. And stacking onto that, um, you know, in your book, you have some great centering practices. And I wonder if you might, um, in the answer of this, also speak a little bit to um, how you promote the importance of and focus in on centering. Yeah, so um, I was raised in an incredibly chaotic household with a mother who tried very much and loved me so much, but ha struggled with dental illness um, and a father who kind of checked out when that happened. Um, okay, checked out a lot when that happened. Um, having been raised in that chaotic environment and being the oldest daughter um, and being sort of parentified in every way, I learned how to be agile right from early childhood, right, right from infancy. So some of these traits that serve me so well are born from my trauma. I think a lot of our gifts are born from our trauma. I don't, the word trauma doesn't scare me. I think that it, it's part of being alive. I don't think that we can have a, a trauma-free life any more than we can have a drama-free life. But I do think that what we do to integrate that trauma and how we come to um, then like deal with it rather than pass it on matters a lot. So I, I learned how to use that, my responsiveness to the chaotic and inconsistent upbringing that I had. I learned to use it to be able to be flexible with people. But that was a hard one lesson because when I first gained adult power, right? Like just the power, the autonomy of being a grown up, I wanted everything to be rigid and fixed and I wanted everything to be my way. And I tried to live that way and it does not work. It is the most anti-relational stance possible. So I crushed people and I hurt people and I was known as a bitch and a hard ass and <laughs> nothing about it was any kind of good. Um, and then I decided I didn't want to be like that anymore. So I again, studied my way out of it. I don't, I didn't have any other way out. Um, there were no, there was no great teacher walked into my life and sat down in front of me. No guide appeared. I had to go find one. My, my hero's journey as it were happened because I decided to walk out my front door quite literally. And when I did, I got the bad news that I was going to have to learn how to be quieter, not because I shouldn't say what my words, but because I couldn't even hear my actual self. I was gonna have to learn how to actually sense my body, actually be aware of it. I did, I was not on board, that was not cool. I was not okay with it. 
um, that took years of convincing and slowly working into like, no, it's okay to actually be in my body. Um, that for me was like, that was the, the breakthrough though. And it's also what allowed me to start to have different conversations. And for me, all of that started with wanting to have really good sex. I was tired of having bad sex. So, <laughs> so I started studying it and learning about it and learning what was going wrong. And what I found out is that I was never in my body. So of course, all the sex I had was bad. When I fixed that problem <laughs> for myself, I all of a sudden had tools to slow myself down, to get centered in my body, to remind myself that I was not the sum of what had happened to me, but was in fact a person at choice who had a history and could make different choices. So when I was writing Project Relationship, um, I wrote it I wrote it for grownups, but I actually, like the reason I started writing it was I woke up at four o'clock in the morning one day in a total panic. I had been planning to write a book, it's true, but I woke up in a panic because I all of a sudden realized that my, um, my kids were teenagers and then I might not be there. Like I could just die, like that could just happen. And if I did, who was gonna tell them? Like all this was so freaking hard to learn. Who was gonna tell them like what to pay attention to? So I got up that morning and started writing it and 28 days later it was written because I just needed to get it out of me. I mean, it wasn't perfect. It was a shitty first draft, that's fine. Following Lamott's advice, that, that was plenty. Um, but at the heart of each chapter was an action, some action that people could take. And I knew that for me, action comes much easier than the assessment. So it was actually writing the assessments that was harder. The, wait, okay, go inside, turn to your body, turn to the sensations, return to your, um, the descriptions, the describing words that are, are wrestling around, they're like, like they're in there, all those describing words for how does it feel and get clear about those things. So all of the practices that slow you down, those are the ones that were hardest for me to write. Um, they're also the ones that I have to actually leave sticky notes, like I have to write actual sticky notes to myself to do them still today because my gut move says, go do the thing, just make a change. But if I take the moment to assess where I actually am, I am a huge fan of a needs assessment. Oh, I love a good needs assessment. If I take those moments to do that, anything is possible. So in this beautiful space of the infinite, I would love you all to each and every one of you go into your chat box and we'll hold these for a moment, but one wild question that you might ask Jolie, or maybe it's not wild, but it's just one that you need a response to. And then I'll ask you to choose a couple of them to answer as we close out this magnificent talk. It's so great having you here, my gosh. She's in Boston, so it's definitely, you know, an evening event, having a lot of fun. <laughs> So hold those questions and we'll have them all come in all at once. I'll give you about 30 seconds to frame up any type of question um, that's on your mind. It could be what's on your necklace. It could be, you know, why is that young book so big and yellow? It could be anything. So I'll give you about 10 more seconds to write in your questions. While they do that, I can tell them the funniest book that's up there. You see that book that's like the, the torment, the one that's green and red. It's split, yeah. like the binding is split. You wanna see something really funny? It's the Marquis de Sade. Tell oh. me that that is not intentionally designed to drive me crazy. This is a sadistic cover for yeah. de Sade's book. Right. I think that's really funny. <laughs> okay, enter those questions. Wow, what great thoughts everybody's having. Keep going, folks. We got a few. There we go. Perfect. So Jolie, choose out one or two that sound interesting to you to dive out, dive into that jump out to you. Yeah. Oh. How did I learn not to let my trauma control my future? Um I went on a on a what can only be called the dark night of the soul. 
you know, as, as it's so commonly described. And, um, I spent some time outside alone at night. And I was currently at that time, afraid of the dark, afraid of being alone, terrified of my own shadow, um, terrified of, of pretty much all of life, even though I lived a very, very bold life, I was really scared of everything. And I had so many phobias and, um, I went outside and waited to hear what I should do next, because this is right after I threw my life into the wood chipper and nothing made sense. I divorce was happening and things were cascading. And the only thing I walked away from that experience, I didn't have like the huge revelatory thing that I had hoped for, but I felt this peace come over me that let me stay in the dark. I just stayed there all night alone. And I had never done that before. And it gave me this sense of peace and tranquility that I could withstand the darkness that was within. That probably sounds terribly poetic. I swear I didn't plan that out. Um, it really was just about deciding to experience that trauma and not let it control me in that one moment. And that gave me the strength to imagine a future where I didn't let that dictate every move I made. And then I did a whole lot of therapy. There's that too. <laughs> um, oh, can jealousy be a good, healthy thing? Here's my take on jealousy. Jealousy can be positive. I'm not sure I would go so far as to say good and healthy, but jealousy can be experienced in positive ways. I have the data to prove it. Um, jealousy can be incredibly arousing. And it can be a wonderful indicator that we care about someone. Both of those things are useful experiences to have, but we often imagine that jealousy is the responsibility of the person out there. So the very first step to dealing with jealousy in a positive way is to recognize that it exists within you and to work from that perspective, to work on understanding what it is that you actually need. And every time you... Every time you're tempted to turn your finger back out and point at the other person and say, they need to do something different so that I feel different, return to yourself and say, wait, I need to get clearer. You may indeed want a new negotiated agreement with a partner. You may indeed want to tell someone something that you haven't said before. But most of the time when jealousy is being experienced in really, really painful and damaging ways, it's because it's being exercised as control and it's being exercised as violence, whether that is physical, emotional, or other um, violent types of communication. Oh. I got over the fear of being vulnerable um, by jumping off a lot of cliffs. It turns out that everyone's human. My father did so much wrong, but he did a great job right from when I was very, very little of telling me everybody has clay feet. It's okay. Everybody's got flaws. And I had terrible self-worth issues, Ter like, like terrible self-worth issues. I still struggle with it, but hiding behind the persona wasn't helping that hiding and hoping people wouldn't notice that I had weaknesses wasn't helping that. And when I started living very boldly, when I started really claiming my space, and I, that has been a process. I mean, I've taken new steps in that just in the last couple of years. When I started really claiming myself, it turns out nobody's, nobody is mad at me for that. No, like there are people who don't like me, but they absent themselves from my life. That's fine. Like I don't have to be everybody's cup of tea. So I just needed to prove it to myself and that it's, I recommend taking a graduated risk approach with that. You don't need to, when I say jump off the cliff, the cliff, the first cliff was probably just, you know, telling a friend that I wanted to be friends, like someone who I wanted to be friends with, just say, like saying, I want to be friends with you, like little things like that, being that kind of vulnerable. And then it got incrementally bigger until I could stand on stages and say ridiculously open wild things that are just true about me.
I've heard so many um, like gems, including referring to ourselves as gems within your talk um, and great questions for follow-up conversations for us to have and maybe uh, things for us to write about. Folks, would you write um, one or a few words in the chat thread that have jumped out to you in the language that Jolie has used today? So great, love it. Would you read those out, Jolie? Oh goodness, um, truth, authentic. authenticity, human experience and authentic being safe for everyone, but not being for everyone. I'll claim that one, no problem. <sighs> Finding fun, yes, please do. And a multifaceted gem, we are all gems. That's right out of Steven Universe. I did not make that up. That is all Rebecca Sugar. Um, trusting your body, please do. Agility, capacity to change gears, stay, ag stay agile, do things that make you happy, trust your body. Boundaries start with what feels good in your own body. We can all start there, like all the time. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this great gift today. It's been such a delight having you here with us. Thank you for having me. It's honestly, it's a total pleasure. I'm, I'm really honored. And thank you for asking such amazing questions. It's, that was fantastic. Awesome. Well, thanks. Um, and we're going to take about a five minute break, folks, and then we'll be back for some um, class function specific stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joel.